Google the brown eye, blue eyed experiment that a teacher did in third grade in Iowa. Jane was thrust into the national spotlight in 1968 with her revolutionary blue eyes, brown eyes exercise. She separated her third grade students based on the color of their eyes, giving preferential treatment to one group over the other to teach them what discrimination feels like. What I do looks brutal to white people because that isn't something they have to live with all day every day. Her no holds barred approach forces all of us to confront our own biases. Did you receive any um, any backlash from administration or any other teachers after your first exercise? <laughs> I'm sure you did. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably still happening to this day, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People have said to me recently, how does it feel to be socially distanced? And I say, well, I've been socially distanced for 52 years. <laughs> I finally got my head right I move in silence, you won't catch me in them headlights And they love to say they love you if they need some If they see you moving solid in your bread's right I finally got my head right I move in silence, you won't catch me in them headlights And they love to say they love you if they need some If they see you moving solid in your bread's right Pick up the county, put it down for the town Everyone I keep... And I wanted to thank you personally for um, coming on and joining our podcast today to talk about some um, some topics that I think that our viewers will be interested to hear, especially from a person like you, um, as smart as you are and, and as enlightened as you are. They're going to be very happy to hear from you. <laughs> I'm glad you said as smart as I am instead of as white as I am, <laughs> which is the only reason, which is the only reason you're talking to me. And you know, as white and as old as I am, I must know something, right? No, but... <laughs> People listen to me because of those two things. People, people listen to me. You know it, and I know it. So just, let's get, let's be honest about this now. Well, let's, let's get into what's it. What's the first question? Let's get into well, it. Let's that's, get into it. That's, yes, ma'am. That's what I'm here for. I don't waste it. <laughs> I like the, I like the way. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Jane, but you're from Iowa. Is that correct? I am in Iowa. Absolutely from Iowa. Okay. And um, a question that if, if this is kind of out of order, but we're getting right into it today. What kind of, um, what experience did you have either as a child or experience as an adult that kind of pushed you towards, you know, t wanting to teach um, social issues and, and, these, and these type of things that you've done? Like, was there a moment or was it just your childhood experience exactly? I had a, I had a father who was a Baptist, who was married to a Catholic, who got married too young, didn't know what was going on, and raised gave help to give birth to seven children, raised six, and would wow. say to us regularly, you don't judge a book by its cover. And a fair thing is a pretty thing and a right wrongs no man. And he lived that way. And he said, if you're gonna lie, don't lie to me. So he never lied. He would not tell a lie. You couldn't get him to tell a lie. He wouldn't gossip and he wouldn't lie. And he said, you know the difference between right and wrong. Now do the right thing, God damn it. And so when you got in a position where you could either do the right thing or the wrong thing, you could hear your father saying, you know the difference between right and wrong. I'll do the right things, idiot. So you did the right thing because you knew the difference. And I think if everybody had that kind of childhood, that we wouldn't be in the mess we're in today. So it was, it was instilled because, in you from a young age. Absolutely. Absolutely. From the moment of my birth, I was taught that you're as good as the best, but no better than the rest. I like that. And that's the way we were, that, yeah, that's the way he taught us. And that's the way he expected us to behave as good as the best, but no better than your, the, than the rest. You can't hold a man. He would say, you can't hold a man in the gutter unless you get in the gutter with him and hold him down. I like that a lot. He, he was very, uh, he was very, he had a father who was absolutely moral and he was absolutely moral. And it's a good thing he was because the rest of us weren't. But we were what he told us we better be. And we were, we were scared to death if what would happen to us if we broke his laws. His laws were very easy. Just do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Use your head. Okay. Uh, you know, and if somebody did something totally stupid, he would say, well, if you went and jumped in a fire, would you follow him into that too? <laughs> and you'd think, yeah, Dad, you have to put it that way. Come on, can't you give you us some sympathy? No. No, you you know the you know the right thing to do. Now I'm gonna do the right thing. So when when I we, there were no blacks in Riceville, Iowa. 
Mm -hmm. The only black we ever saw was a quarterback <clears throat> on the Manly football team. He was the only black in the conference. Wow. And my brother played football against him and said he was the best athlete he ever played against. He said he was the most, um, he was, he was a real sportsman and he was a real sincere sportsman. And he really admired Leroy Dunn. Leroy awesome. Dunn went on to play for professional football, I believe. But my, my brother never stopped saying the best football player he ever played against was Leroy Dunn. And then I married my husband and we moved to Waterloo, Iowa. No, first I, I went to college and I found out that the student, the black students on the campus were smarter than I was, were better clothed than I was, had more money than I had, knew more than I did. And I thought, oh my God, I've been lied to about these, these people all my life. What in the devil is going on here? Then I got married, we moved to Waterloo, Iowa, which at that time was called Little Chicago because of the large black population. And my husband ran a grocery, um, uh, food of store, supermarket, in the north end of Waterloo, which was the black section. So all, virtually all of his customers were black. And once again, we learned that we had been lied to for 23 years about the black population. They were absolutely fantastic. The only person who regularly stole from him was the federal meat inspector. He regularly chose to stole two pounds of cheese every time he came, came to the store. Oh, so and my husband good. didn't dare say you can't do that because if he if he confronted him, then we wouldn't his meat case wouldn't pass the inspection. So he had to watch oh. this guy do it. And, and see it was that kind of thing that if you watched it happen, you thought, Oh good Lord. And then we, he was transferred to another town and we were buying a house and Daryl didn't want to go without us. So we put the house up for sale. And this is when I found out that I'm a racist. A woman called and said, do you rent to coloreds? And I can remember as well as if it happened this morning, what I did, I said to her, this is an all white neighborhood because I knew and I thought if I rent this to a black person, when we come back here, and we will get transferred back here. Nobody will have anything to do with this. So I did what a racist does. I forced her to make the decision. And she said, all right, thank you, and hung up. And I knew what I had done. And at that moment, I determined that I will never, ever succumb to the preachings and the teachings of the people who are determined to keep this country a racist country. I'll wow. never do it again, not for money, not for love, not for family, not for acceptance, not for anything will I go along with racism. And that has caused my offspring some real severe problems. And I know that, but they too will not go along with racism. Wow, I wish that experience would translate more to people today. Like that was a real, that was a moment of just some um, vulnerability you kind of had, you kind of stepped back, you stepped back and said, wow, this is what I'm doing, this ends right now. But if your community, if your community, if your family, if your peers, if your associates are all thoroughly convinced of the rightness of whiteness and the idea of three or four different races on the face of the earth, and they have learned that all their lives, <clears throat> and as they say, it was good enough for my dad and it's good enough for me. It wasn't good enough for their dad. It wasn't good enough for anyone to believe the lie of several different races. There's only one. And anyone who reads the book, The Myth of Race, will, if they have a brain cell, will give up the idea of several different races. The book is absolutely fantastic. And well-researched, well this guy did, wasn't writing off the top of his head. Robert Weld Sussman wrote the book, The Myth of Race. And the biggest mistake, if he, made a lot, he may have made a lot of mistakes, I don't know, I wasn't there. But the title of the book is The Biggest Mistake He Made. Because a myth is something that you make up because you don't understand something in nature. So you make up a myth, like the Greeks had a myth that said that the sun is a god, is a golden chariot that carries a god across the sky every morning. That was a myth. Mm -hmm. A lie is something that you make up to justify some undesirable or ugly action that you are performing. And that's what racism is. It's an ugliness and it's based on a lie. Now, it's time for us to get over that lie. It's time for us to recognize that it's a lie and stop believing it. And by the gods of war, stop telling it to our children. And teachers have to stop lying to their students. We have to stop talking about 
three or four different races. We are all members of the family of man. We all belong to the same race. We are all homo sapiens. We are all descendants of those first modern human beings who evolved in sub-Saharan Africa between 300,000 and 500,000 years ago. And I, when I go to town now, I wear this mask. See what it says? Get over it. Get over it, people. Get over it. It's time to get over it. Nobody is born a bigot. You have to be taught to be a bigot. You have to be taught to be a racist. And now somebody is going to say, well, aren't blacks racist too? No. You can't be a racist unless you have the power to institutionalize yes. your ugly beliefs. This is what so no, understand. that's not possible. Yeah. This is what no, this is what, but, but white people have to accuse blacks of being wrong because if they aren't wrong, they aren't just like us after all. <laughs> you know, we have to, that's the one, that's the one place where we want to be similar. We want to say, well, you're just as racist as we are. They couldn't be more wrong. Absolutely. Blacks don't have, and, and we've got, we've got to get rid of the two words, white and black. Yeah. White and black are chosen because they are total opposites. White is the color of justice and goodness, goodness and purity. Black is the color of evil and badness. And that's the reason those two words were chosen during the Spanish Inquisition. And that's when this whole thing started. There yeah. was none of this before the Spanish Inquisition. So it's only been since the late 1400s that people even thought there were three or four different races. This is so ridiculous that we are still believing in it instead of calling since we're talking about skin color when we talk about white and black there are no white people there are no white there are no people whose skin is the color of your shirt and mine you understand that there are no white people and there are very damn few really really black people they may be very very dark brown but they are not really black get <laughs> over that one I'm so one. instead of call, well, yeah, but you're, you're not really really black Yes, ma'am. As I tell you what, as a kid growing up in an all white area, that I got teased a lot for that. And that's kind of something that yeah. it was something hard to grow up with, getting, you know, getting the call those names. And that's kind of something I had to as a man, I grew up and you know, really appreciated who I was and I wasn't, you know. Well, I'll bet if I'll bet if you put this on that I could tell where this stopped and your skin began. Absolutely. This yeah, is sure. black. <laughs> yeah, so you see, this is, this is bad. This isn't education, what we've offered in this country. What we offer in this country in the schools is indoctrination. We teach you how to be a good United States of America citizen. We teach you what to believe. We teach you that George Washington never told a lie. We teach you that, Abraham, that uh, Barack Obama was our first black president. Abraham Lincoln was our first black president, for God's sake. Abraham Lincoln was a melungeon. He was part black, part white and part Cherokee Indian. And he lived in that. Kentucky. And in that, in that area, there are a whole lot of Melungeons. And now most of them have moved to Texas. See, these are the things we didn't learn in school. We I learned that George Washington, never, never. George Washington never told a lie. Well, what are people going to learn in the future about this president? He never told the truth. But will we tell <laughs> that? No, no, we won't tell that. We won't tell that the truth. We won't tell the truth. We will pretty up everything ugly that any person who is president of the United States ever did. We won't tell the truth about <laughs> Dwight Eisenhower, who was the one who put the words under God into the pledge, which do not belong there. But he agreed to do it because the members of the Knights of Columbus had lobbied their congressmen to get the words under God into the pledge. And they sent that up to, to Dwight Eisenhower and he signed it because it didn't really mean much. We're supposed to have separation of church and state in this country, but we put the words under God into the pledge. Now, I know lots of kids whose parents do not believe in God. I have two granddaughters sure. who do not believe, who, have a, who are Muslim, whose father is Islamic. They have a right not to believe that the supreme being is named God. They have a right to that, but not in this country. If you go to school in this country, you have to say the words under God in the pledge. They weren't there when I was a child, and they don't belong there now. Yeah, why, how, why do you think Christianity has played such a huge role in United States policies or beliefs or, or anything? I mean, it, it's crazy. Be, because, because we don't want to really be Christians. Come on. <laughs> exactly. You really, think, you, really think that, you really think that what we practice as Christianity in this country is what Jesus taught? Give me Absolutely a break. Absolutely not. In the Bible, it says, it says, and, now, and so abideth these three things, faith, 
hope, and charity. Charity means selfless giving. We well, do none we of that. White folks, <laughs> we, now, we don't want to do that, so we just changed it to love. Now, if you love somebody, you don't have to spend any money at it, and you don't have to give up anything. You can just say, I do this because I love you. I love you but yeah. if you have to do charity, if you have to be charitable, then you have to spend some money. I talked to two ministers yesterday, and I don't think they expected to get what they got. I think they may have been a little, a little off by you. concerned. <laughs> I don't know whether they were, they didn't say they were, but I know that if they kind went to church this morning and, and decided to do what I told them to, they said they, had, they work at feeding the hungry. I said, oh. Yeah, we do that once a week. We feed, we hand out food baskets. Mm -hmm. I said, you put money in them? Well, no, we're there to hand out food. Wait a minute, you know, um, think about what those folks need besides food. Yeah. And you, you have a church? Well, yes. Do you have Sunday school rooms? Yes. You have a fairly large uh, uh, building and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, a, a Sunday, Sunday school building. There. Well, yes, we do. Well, how many homeless people would that hold? How many beds could you make on church pews? How many people could sleep in the pews in your church and so be out of the hot heat or out of the cold, out of the weather and feel safe? How many people could you house in your church? Plenty. Now, yeah, now that's a whole new way of looking at Christianity, isn't it? And it's a whole new way of looking at, <laughs> and now abideth these three things, faith, hope, and charity. Mm -hmm. It's almost like, See, there wants to be a helping hand, but from a distance. Like, it's not like, you know. Well, it's like what we're doing right now. People are saying, we're going to be allies. Mm -hmm. I refuse to be an ally. If you want a partner, I'll be your partner. We can get a, have a partnership. But we're not going to have an allyship because that indicates superior, superior and inferior. I'm mm -hmm. not here to help you. I'm here to, for both of us, to make the world a better place in which all of us can live. I, I don't want to be an ally because, well, yeah, but that's what it's about. But when you say ally, that means somebody that can walk away. Yeah. That's and right. I, I don't intend to, I don't intend to walk away from what I do because I'm, I'm too damn mean. Let's face it. I'm just <laughs> absolutely determined that this nonsense has, this nonsense has to stop right now. We are living with the consequences of allowing someone to buy the presidency. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. And, and it, it has to be, we have to realize what's going on and this has to be ended in November. Won't end until January 25th, 22nd. But I'm in hopes that this fool doesn't take us into war between now and then in order to help himself stay in the presidency. That's Absolutely. what you need to worry about. And that's a real word. Anyway, what's, what? What's the discussion we are going to have today? Are we done now? Oh, we're, we're, no. we're right in the thick of it. We're right in the thick of the discussion. <laughs> the, the big question that I actually wanted to ask you as, as being an educator is, you know, obviously your most famous exercise that you did back in 1968. You know, today, how can we translate the same teachings of like we just talked about into today's education system? You know, how can school boards adopt curriculum that teaches this instead of, you know, for example, a lot of Southern schools still call the Civil War the Northern Aggression. We have to re-educate the educators. Mm -hmm. Our educators were taught the same things that you and I were. We were taught that there, they were taught that there were several different races. They were taught the rightness of whiteness. They were taught the greatness of those who are tall white males. They were taught you go along to get along. They were taught a whole lot of nonsense that wasn't real. And you need to realize that you can't, if you think I'm lying about that or that I'm exaggerating it, get the book, The Color of Law. And if you haven't read The Color of Law, you don't re really realize what's happening in this country, what has happened and what is happening today. You read this book and you'll realize that most of the segregation we have in this country is not de facto segregation. It isn't because people of different color groups didn't want to live together. It's because the people who wrote the laws believed in the myth of three or four different races. And so they wrote, wrote laws and are still writing laws to perpetuate that myth. If you read this book, you'll realize what I'm talking about and you'll be absolutely furious. And you'll, and you'll, be, turn, you'll be determined 
never ever to just go along to get along again. And then here's another book. I found this book two weeks ago because I had to do something. And I had read this book before and it's in my library, Beyond Racism by Whitney Young Jr. This man was brilliant. And the book that he wrote, and I think this was in 1969, I'm not sure, but I am quite certain. Anyway, in 1969, the book that he wrote described exactly what is happening in this country today. Exactly. We have yeah. gone right back to 1969. We have gone right back in this country to what was happening in 1969. However, we've gone even farther back than that. Right now, for the last four years, three and a half years, I've thought, this is Hitlerian. That's what's happening today is what Hitler did. What the devil is going on here? And I've been, then I've been saying to myself, Jane, you're, you're hysterical. You're an old person. You don't know what you're talking about. That's not really what's going on. And then I read this. When at times the mob is swayed by Burt Newborn. Have you read it? No, ma'am. No. I don't suppose you have. Listen to this. There, then there is Donald Trump, the only president in recent American history to openly despise the twin ideals, individual dignity, and fundamental equality. You need to read, you need to realize that <laughs> He studied at the feet of the master. We know from Ivana Trump's new, now sealed testimony, sealed testimony at Trump's first divorce trial, backed up by her lawyer, Michael Kennedy, and from the president himself, that for years, a younger Donald Trump slept with the book of Adolf Hitler's collected political speeches published in 1941 as my new order in a locked cabinet at his bedside. Ugly and appalling, appalling as they are, those speeches are masterpieces of demagogic manipulation. This man is basing his governing policies off the policies of Adolf Hitler. And if you don't believe that, you need to read this book. Now, wow. the reason I recognize it, yeah, this is really scary. The reason I recognize it is I was born in 1933, the year that Adolf Hitler and Franklin Roosevelt came to power in their respective countries. From 1933 till 1945, I heard my father just ranting about what Adolf Hitler was doing because that was when he took over Germany and then was trying to take over the world. And my father would come home just incensed at what was going on. And then of course the second world war came along and here's this fool, this Adolf Hitler, the fool doing this absolutely unacceptable things. And now here we are 85, 86 years later, Reliving with it. an utter fool doing the same living. things that Hitler did. Now, there's a saying, those who forget the mistakes of the past are doomed to repeat them. Yep. We have forgotten the mistakes of the past of the 1930s, and we are repeating them. And people don't realize it because they aren't as old as I am. Why are but so people many people who are as old as this I guy? Why? Because they don't know any better. The same reason the Germans, Germany was a highly civilized yeah. country with some of the finest philosophers, some of the fine, some, some really brilliant people. They didn't realize what was going on. 30% of the population in the United States, number one, is too young to know what's going on mm -hmm. and too, too, too uh, susceptible to idiocy. We will follow this fool, this Pied Piper, through the crack in the wall and give up our democracy in order not to be seen as unaccepting of our president. This man has no business being president. If the members of the, I know what you're going to do with this information, and frankly, I don't care, but you need to realize that just last week, Donosaurus T. Rump issued an edict that said <laughs> the federal, federal government employees will no longer be involved in diversity training. I saw that. Oh I my see that. Jesus. I saw that too. For the, for the love of heaven, why not? Because he doesn't want them to know the truth because he doesn't want changes to happen, because he wants to shut those of us up who know that what is going on is wrong and is not genetic. This is not genetic. This is learned stupidity. It, you weren't stupid in the beginning, but we can make you stupid did you if also we train see you about to act the, in stupid ways. Did you also see about the, about he was talking about in the teaching of the 1619 Project in California? that he would cut funding for schools that are using that. Oh, as yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. He is going to destroy education. He isn't going to destroy indoctrination. 
but he is going to destroy anything that smacks of leading people out of ignorance. You have to have an ignorant society in order to keep somebody like this in power. And if he can keep us ignorant and keep young people ignorant, he can continue to be what he is today. We have to put a stop to this. It's just, it's absolutely, if you care for democracy, you have to vote against this man. Would you say this is our democracy? Would you classify this as the most um, important election, maybe of your lifetime, or one of the most important that you've seen? Absolutely, the most absolutely the most important one of my lifetime. Absolutely, because the democracy is on the line this year. Democracy Mm -hmm. is on the ballot. Make no mistake about that. He does not intend to keep this country a democracy. He wants an autocracy, and he is an authoritarian. And he is going to have it his way or no way. And we have to get him out of there. But, you know, I wasn't crazy about Hillary Clinton, but she would have been far better than this. I agree. I, I had, used to have a dog. I used to have, a, I, yeah, I used to have a dog that would have been a, been a better dog. <laughs> I was dog just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I agree. Now, on this podcast, we've been, uh, we've been preaching how important it is for us to vote and um, for us young people to get out and vote. And I know in the past interviews you've done, you've spoken about um, – getting on the offense and not playing defense anymore. Besides voting, what's some other ways that we can, you know, play offense instead of defense in regards to, you know, social injustice? Go to my website. Go to my website. First thing you can do, the first thing you can do is stop listening to people who say, when I have, have you, sir, ever had somebody say to you, when I see you, I don't see you black. Oh yeah, absolutely. Growing up. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see see race. I don't see you black. Yeah. I don't see color. When a woman says to me, and it's always some liberal pale face, well, stop calling them white and start calling them what they are. Uh, (laughs) Menanemic, melanemic. She's melanemic. If you don't have enough iron in your blood, you are anemic. If you don't have enough melanin in your skin so that your skin has color, you are melanemic. It's always some melanemic female who comes up to me and says, I'm colorblind. I don't see color. And for a while, I didn't know how to respond to that. And I finally figured it out. I finally said, uh, I knew that before you told me, because if you saw color, you wouldn't wear that shirt with those pants. (laughs) (laughs) Had to let her know. Had to let her know. (laughs) And and you wouldn't have that color hair, because I know that isn't natural. And then they get angry and say, you don't understand. And I say, I know exactly what you're saying. I understand exactly what you're saying. In order for you to relate to another person, you have to pretend that you don't see the color of their skin because you have negative thoughts about skin color. That's not what I meant. And I say, look, it doesn't matter what you meant by what you said. What mattered is how it is perceived. And I perceive that as a racist statement. I would advise you not to make it again. Now, most blacks, when you say that to most blacks, they'll say, oh, thank you. As if your skin color were something to be ashamed of. You need to remember that (laughs) if every person on the face of the earth, every person on the face of the earth would trace his or her or their or whatever pronoun we're using right now, maybe just say it. If every person would trace its DNA back as far as you could trace it, you would find a percentage of your DNA came from a country in Africa. And that is a fact. And you can dispute it until hell freezes over. That is a fact. And it's a fact that I found out millennials do not like to he- want to hear. I talked to a group this week, last Especially. week, and after we were done, some woman called me and said, everybody was just so excited. They all just think it's wonderful. I said, no, they didn't at all. She said, well, a few people had a problem with it. I said, who had the problem? She said, well, the millennials. I said, the millennials? Yes, they said, we don't want to give up our race. We don't want to give up our race. We like the race we're in. I said, well, they need to learn that there's only one race. They don't have, they don't have the opportunity to give it up. They're going to be human, homo sapiens as long as they live. Well, she says, they, they just don't want to give it up and just, just be one of the others. I said, they're always going to be just one of the human race. Get over it. But I think young black people, millennial black people, don't want to give up the kind of um, – good feeling that martyrdom gives them. If they can assume victimhood, then they can always be different because you see, see the way we're treated. Well, that's fine if that's what you want, but it's based that. on something totally ridiculous. And I think white people don't want to give up the rightness of whiteness because for years we have said, if you're white, you must be right. And the only reason I get hired to do these things is because I'm white. I know that. You know that. 
Everybody knows that. Have Jane Elliott come in. She's white and white people will listen to her because they can't say she's, she's taking advantage of her skin color. Yes, I am taking advantage of my skin color. And I'm well, using good. my skin color to say, well, well, I don't know what, they don't think it's good. But no, but millennials need to know that they have no choice. People of different colors, every one of them are still members of the same race. Right. Yeah. There is no white race. There is no black race. But if you're going to really get nasty about it, you'd have to say that the only people on the face of the earth were black in the beginning, or what mm. we would call black. They were very, very dark skin because they came from Africa and they were exposed to a lot of sunlight, so their bodies produce a lot of melanin. So you see, they are melanicious, and people without much melanin are melanemic instead of white and black. But you see, white and black are at two opposites. One is good and one is bad. In the cowboy movies, in the olden times, and, and this week, the good guy wears a white hat and the bad guy wears a black one. We're still doing the same thing. It's time to get over it. And these Melanie, millennials need to get over needing to be a different race because they aren't. They we can't aren't. have that. We aren't at all. Jane, before we... Before no, we you let, aren't. Exactly. Before wait, we I, let you get out of here. Wait, 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 go ahead. No, no. Wait, you wait, keep wait, talking wait. as much as you want. You... Well, you've got to hear. You've got to go to my website and download the printed language materials. Okay. Yeah, the first page is a set is a set of typical statements that white folks make that think they aren't racist. For instance, I have a black friend. Racism exists only. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, I have a black friend. Racism <laughs> exists only only where minorities exist. Remove the minorities, and we won't have these problems. Oh, for the love of God! The when word. I did the, the blue eyed brown eyed yeah when, yeah yeah when I did the blue eyed brown eyed exercise with my students the first year. Up at the coffee shop, the men gathering on, around the table said, why is, she, why is she doing that exercise in Riceville? We don't have any racism in Riceville. We don't have any N-words. You see, if there aren't any of those people here, we can't be racist. Get a clue. None of my third graders had ever been in the per presence of a person of color, but they knew every negative stereotype you've ever heard about black people. Mm -hmm. Go through 100%. these typical statements. Everybody should do that. And then... Look at the clarifications of those statements. Racism exists only where black people exist. Okay. The clarification of that is, if I can find it, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. Do I have that page? Well, of course I do. It says the problem is in being a minority, not in the reaction of whites to minorities. You see, wow. we wouldn't have these problems if whites weren't, ra weren't racist. It isn't because there's a minority. And you need to remember that racism isn't based on skin color. Skin color is not the problem. Ignorance about skin color is the problem. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You can't change your skin color, but you can change the level of ignorance in the people that, ha that you have to deal with. And you do that through education, not through training, not through counseling, not through teaching, not through manipulation, not through indoctrination, through education, and that word educate means to lead people out of ignorance. ignorance. I think this goes along with your uh, discussion about um, melting pot versus salad bowl. It's not about being tolerant. It's about teaching acceptance. You know what, like, exactly how you pre preach? I don't, I don't use salad bowl anymore either. Okay. That's, those a, okay. Are all, but that's too easy. No. Instead of thinking of this country as a melting pot, think of it as a stir fry. A stir fry. Ooh. Okay. That's and a better. stir fry... You, 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 salad you, put, anyway. you put all these different colored and flavored and textured things and you add a little heat to it and you stir it up. And when you, when you stop the cooking of it, all those things have maintained their identity. You don't want them to lose their identity. And in a country that isn't racist, it's all right to be your color, your size, your shape, your gender, your sexual orientation, your religion. All those things are part of the whole of that group of people that a melting pot isn't as good as a stir fry it takes form to well it, it takes lots of different kinds of, of pieces and lots of different colors and lots of different textures and lots of different flavors and then you put it over rice and that represents the white people <laughs> you get covered <laughs> up with all these other different things and pretty soon they begin to look like them and they begin to enjoy them and it's, rice alone isn't worth a damn but rice covered with all those wonderful things 
out of that stir fry. Yep. It, it, it just blends in with all the rest of them. It makes it for a really remarkable dish in my okay. estimation. Did you receive any, um, any backlash from administration or any other teachers after your first exercise? <laughs> I'm sure you did. <laughs> <laughs> it's sure probably still was... happening to this day, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People have said to me recently, how does it feel to be socially distanced? And I say, well, I've been socially distanced for 52 years. <laughs> Ever since I did the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise, I've been socially distanced. <laughs> I can walk down the street in Riceville and have people almost run away from me. It is really funny. And the same thing happens in Osage when I, when particularly one of the men that I put through the blue-eyed, brown-eyed exercise during a Rotary Club luncheon several years ago, when he would see, he finally died, I think of anger, but he would see me coming toward him on the street and he'd turn and go the other way. And then he, he got into a motorized wheelchair and he'd see me coming toward me and he'd put that thing around <laughs> the, the sidewalk and go the other way as fast as he could because he, oh yeah, I, yeah, um, yeah, my mother kicked me out of the family after my dad died. So that, that was, that was unfortunate for half an hour. And I cried for half an hour and then I came up away from the creek where I was crying and making myself feel better and got to feeling better and decided, well, okay, that's the way it is. Okay. I can understand that. So I didn't see any of my family members except my one sister, my oldest sister would occasionally stop by just on her way home from work, but she wouldn't stay very long because she knew that that wasn't what her mother wanted to her to do. I had embarrassed the family. You've ruined our reputation in this community. Well, there, I figured out there are only a thousand people in that community. How bad could that be? Can't be too bad. So I, I kind of got, I, yeah, I got over it, but it was bad for my kids. My kids were beaten and spit on, their yeah. belongings were destroyed. And a teacher came to, we had four children going to that school that I was teaching in. And the principal's wife who taught at the high school or the junior high came to me at a teacher's meeting one day and said, Jane, you gotta get your kids out of the school. I said, why? She said, because these teachers are trying to destroy your children. So we moved 17 miles from Riceville I kept on teaching in Riceville, so they didn't get rid of the problem. I was the problem. They didn't get rid of the problem. I wasn't going to let them that happen. And no, no uh, administrator ever offered to fire me. Wow. And I, they never they told me a, until too. the last one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, actually, <laughs> they knew that if they did, I would call the NAACP or I would call the civil rights people and say, look, I'm being fired because of this. But they didn't know. The administrators didn't want to because... As Mr. J, the superintendent who was there most of the time I was teaching there said, when they interviewed him years later, why didn't you fire her? And he said, I could have fired her, but I knew that what, I knew that what she was doing was right. How could I fire her for doing the right thing? And that's the reason I didn't get fired is because I had the, the superintendent, every superintendent, every principal that I had, except the last one, the last one tried to stop me. And I said, <laughs> I know where you were last night. We went to a school board meeting. I said, and I know which parent told you to tell me not to do the exercise tomorrow. Now, here's what you can do. You tell, call that man and you tell him that if he wants me fired, he should send me a letter by registered mail. And I'll send that letter to the Des Moines Register. Now, if his main problem is he's afraid we'll get more, too much publicity, I'll fix it so he'll get a lot of publicity. All he has to do is write me a letter that says he doesn't want me to do that exercise. And the principal said, I'll call him. I said, that's a good idea. <laughs> and I said, and you might also tell him that I know how to teach children. He knows how to raise hogs. He should stick to what he knows and let me stick to what I know. So he yeah. called me in the afternoon before I went home that day. And he said, uh, Jane, uh, I talked to Mr. So-and-so and and we've decided that you can do the exercise. I said, fine, I'm glad you came to that decision. He said, uh, can I help you? I said, yeah, I'll send my third, my uh, blue-eyed kids down here in the morning before <laughs> class, and you can hold them here, or you can just call up the, you know, call on the intercom mm -hmm. and say, you want this list of kids, and I'll send them down here, and then I'll prepare the brown-eyed kids while the blue-eyed kids are out of the room. He said, I can do that. So the next morning, he said, you come in in the morning, we'll finish planning on it. So I went in the next morning and there sat the superintendent in a chair with the newspaper in front of his face, reading the newspaper and listening to us plan this exercise for the day. And I thought, I think I'm in love with you two guys. You are absolutely doing the most brilliant thing here. What they were doing was they were fixing it so that if they had, if I had to be fired, 
for doing the exercise, then they can say, wait a minute, we were in on the planning. We knew exactly what was going to happen. Do you want to fire all, all of us? And, that's not and I thought that took, that took courage and that took commitment and that proved that they were educators, not just administrators. I was absolutely tickled to death. That's awesome. I never had a problem with it. I never had a problem with an, an administrator except that one. And that one, then he changed it changed considerably because uh, we did the exercise and we had good luck, luck with it again because it works beautifully with junior high people. And they all learned something that <laughs> after that, one of the junior high teachers came down to caught to uh, lunch in the junior high my sister was substituting there and the junior high teacher came in for lunch and she was just furious and my sister said well what happened and she said that the worst thing happened in my classroom just like i don't know what to do i want to know what you do about it. she said what happened she said i used the n-word only she didn't say n-word she said the word and one of my students stood up and said we don't use that word in this school and if you're going to use it i'm going to go out in the hall until you stop using it she said what would you have done and my sister said, well, I guess I'd stop using the N-word. <laughs> I guess that's so. Now, the student had to teach the teacher. The yeah. student shouldn't have had to teach the teacher. But he learned at the third grade level that there are th words you do not use. Absolutely. Unless you're a person of color. If people of color want to use that word, the power with that, from that, in that word in a person of color is totally different from the kind of power that it holds when it's used by a melanemic person. And we ought not to use it. I'm absolutely, I'm absolutely opposed to that word, but not for black people. And okay. I hear young black males use it all the time. That is, part of their, that is part of their language and they have a right to have their own language. And if melanemic people don't like it, all they have to do is not listen. With all the things that pushed back black people for hundreds of years, it's like there's one word we're, we're asking people not to say and it's oh, like, yeah. It's really yeah, that's this hard. Is, that's this too is, hard. Uh, yeah. That's too hard. Yeah. This is uh, this is this is the crust of bread that we're going to give you. We'll stop using the N word, but we'll still imprison you. Yeah. We still have slavery in the United States of America in our prison industrial system. Make no mistake about that. That is slavery with a different name. Racism works in this country and is perpetuated in this country because it is a money maker. That's literally how our country was formed, right? I mean, literally on the backs of slaves where getting free labor and, and, and all that, and it still continues. You're absolutely right. Well, that wasn't the very, very beginning. But in the very beginning, the only slaves we had were indentured servants and Native Americans. And we realized very quickly that Native Americans could run away and escape into the nearest village, and we couldn't tell them apart. Mm. So just like just like the people during the Spanish Inquisition, we had to have a way to identify those that we wanted to enslave. And Native Americans, that wasn't, it didn't work with them because they could get away. We couldn't identify them. So we imported people that didn't look like the people who were here. And that's the reason we started. That's the reason we used black people, because we couldn't do it with natives because they, were, they couldn't be identified. We couldn't do it with white people because you couldn't tell what their religion was for sure. Yeah, and you didn't want you didn't want to enslave Christians. You couldn't always tell which what you were dealing with. So let's find somebody whose color is really different in this area. And the, not funny, but the ironic part of that is that native what we call Native Americans, First Nations people, came from the same place that all the rest of us did. They did not evolve out of the soil of the United States of America. They came from Africa, just like everybody else did. And if you don't believe that, then you need to get the National Geographic magazine for April. I'm taking notes. I'm uh, taking notes of all these books, Jim. I, I got a lot of. Well, you have to. You you got to do more than take notes on this one. You've got to send for this magazine and read the darn thing. This is the National Geographic magazine for April of 2018, and here is a map. See this map? This yeah. map shows where modern human beings started and how they moved from there without the advantage of any modern technology to populate every landmass on the face of the earth. Every landmass on the face of the earth was populated by the people who started here. Oh. And the only reason my skin is lighter than yours is because as they moved farther from the equator, particularly up in this area, their bodies were exposed to less and less sunlight, so their bodies produced less and less melanin. 
So their hair, their skin, and their eyes got lighter. Their brains didn't get bigger and their brains didn't get smaller, but they physically changed. And their, your body's adapted to the natural environment, which is why <laughs> First Nations people have longer legs, longer arms, longer hands in many cases, because they are descendants of those first modern human beings. Wow. Every person on the face of the earth, every one of us, every one of these, of these areas was populated originally by people who came from here. Now, I'm getting really sick of people saying, well, you know how those people are. They, are, they just know, know as much as we do. I think you ask. No, I don't think that. Yes, I do, but I don't dare say it. I think, <laughs> how dare you be that ignorant? If they weren't brilliant, how did they make that journey? And how did they accomplish that? If they weren't brilliant. Exactly. Now, somebody is going to call me and have a discussion with me about the creation story. That always comes up when I say we all, we, we're all, we all are descendants of those first modern human beings that evolved in sub-Saharan Africa between 300,000 and 500,000 years ago. Every single one of us. Well, well, and, and, and inevitably, some woman says, well, what about the creation story? And I'll say, I'm glad you brought that up. That's a really good example, and that's a really good proof of what I'm saying, because it says in the Bible that God created man out of dust. Well, mm-hmm. dust is a euphemism for dirt. We didn't want to say black. Man was made out of dirt, so we said dust. Dust, dirt at the Garden of Eden was either very, very dark brown or black because it was made out of rotted palm fronds. That was an oasis. And there, were, there was vegetation there. And when vegetation rots and falls to the ground, it turns either very, very dark, dark brown or black. Right? Yeah. So the first man made by God was black by God because that's what color the dirt was. And the first woman was made out of Adam's rib, the black man. Now, all bone tissue is white because it's made out of calcium. So the first woman was made white, but she was made out of a black man's rib. Okay. So all of us originally, according to the Bible, start out black. Now, you see, I think that's a lovely story. I think there are lots of lovely stories in the Bible. They are things to teach you things, but they aren't necessarily true. It didn't happen that way. That's not the way it happened. But if you're going to use the Bible to support the myth of race, then you better be really aware of what it is the Bible is saying. And you better interpret it the way I do. And nobody wants to. (laughs) What they want to say, that man was made out of dust and that was sand. Well, you know, if you've got a handful of sand, it's going to fall, slide right through your fingers. It's going to sift right through your fingers. So the first man wasn't made out of sand. The first man was made out of dirt. And dirt in the Garden of Eden was made partially out of rotted vegetation. So when you call somebody a rotter, you're right, because he was made out of rotted vegetation. We have to put, nobody wants, <laughs> nobody wants nobody to wants interpret to the that. Bible in that way. No, they don't want to say that. You're of made out of not. mud. You're made out of dirt. You weren't made out of dust. You're yeah. made out of dirt. Well, I just got and she said, I just don't understand. I say, I know you don't understand. But the reason you don't understand is because you don't want to understand. Exactly. And that's what Jane, what, because um, you're, what you're, go on. No, I was just going to say, Jane, um, what advice could you give? I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm a young teacher. Terry's girlfriend is a young teacher as well. What advice could you give to us? Because I, you're such a huge inspiration to me personally as a teacher. Um, what can I do? Teach the, tr- teach the truth. Teach the truth. And that means you have to read it. Go to, my, go to my website, download the bibliography, read everything on it. Okay. Because what you learned in elementary, junior, senior, high school, and college was the same old, same old. Mm-hmm. And they've done studies that prove in this country that the longer you stay in school, the more bigoted you become. Because year after year after year, you are reinforced in what you learn grades K through 12. Yeah. And most of what you learn grades K through 12 was for the purpose of making you into a good American citizen. Now, that's the first thing you have to give up. We have to give up calling this country America. We all seem to believe that America is these 48 contiguous states and Alaska and Hawaii and the islands of the southern, southeastern coast of the United States. That is not all of America. America, my friend, is everything from... The tip of, come right here, the tip of Canada, 
to the tip of South America. Everybody in here is an American. Get over it. Now, first we say, we believe in America and we, we are good Americans and we want Americans to be happy. So we build a wall across <laughs> the Southern border of the United States to keep those people out who aren't Americans. Everybody south of that border is an American. Wow. Central America, Latin America, South America. Everybody wow. north is an American. These are all Americans. You see, and you use this map. When you get in the classroom, never, ever use the Mercator projection map. Because if you use the one that is made by certain companies, and practically all of them say the same thing except this one, and they didn't have room on this because it was in a book. So, at, But on, in the legend of the map, the last sentence on the legend says, South America is actually nine times larger than Greenland. That's what it says on the legend. But here's the map with Greenland larger than South America. Why is Green why, why did they do it like that? <laughs> because according to what I've learned, the Pope commissioned Mercator That's to right. make a map that showed the spread of Christianity. So obviously really? the countries in the northern half, and that isn't the northern half, <laughs> the northern part of the world where most of the where the most of the Christianity was spread were bigger than the countries in the southern half. Another thing on this map, the equator, I'm sure you know, is a line halfway between the North Pole and the South Pole that separates the world into two equal portions, the, nor the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. The zero, deg on zero degrees on this map is clear down here. Clear down here. This is the equator. Does this separate this map into two equal portions? No. It's down here. Hell no, it does isn't. If you use this map, if you use the Mercator map, you can't call this the Northern Hemisphere because hemi means half. So you can't call this the Northern Hemisphere. I don't know what you're going to call it, but it doesn't work to call it Hemisphere. You can't call this the Southern Hemisphere because it's only this much of the map. This is, be this is the miseducation of the American mind. There's a better way. Let me show you. I just happen to have a better way here. <laughs> Which fell on the floor. No, that wasn't being careful. All right, now, here's a better map. Have you ever seen this map before? No. And if you haven't, no. why haven't you? Nope, of course you haven't. You're just a teacher. You don't know, have to know anything. People think about this. <laughs> this is the Peter's projection map. Look at the size of Greenland on this map and look at the size of South America. Wow. Way different. Now, the shapes on this map are distorted, but the sizes and the locations are right. Like the Every United States. Every school child... Well, here's, look at the United States here, and look at the size of Canada here. Then look at Canada at on this one. map. That's all I was just going to say. Look at Canada. Look at here. Canada stretches from hell to breakfast on this map. <laughs> this makes no sense. No, no, no. It simply makes no sense, people. It's, we have known this for a very long time. But your standard elementary curriculum says use the Mercator map. Don't use the Mercator map. This, on this map, Africa is 14 times larger than Greenland. Not on this one. Look at Africa and then look at Greenland. You see, this is the reason Donald Trump wanted to buy Greenland. He thought it was this big. <laughs> and somebody got to him, got to him and said, no, 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 Donzi baby. It's only this big. You don't want to invest a lot of money there. This is an important concept. If you're a teacher, you had better send to Capital O, capital D, capital T, maps.com, odtmaps.com, and get copies of this map. And if you have children, or if you have relatives who have children, get that, that map in place, a uh, place map, have it laminated. And so when your kids eat breakfast in the morning, they'll see the world the way you want them to see it instead of the way the teacher wants them to see it. And with that, you can also get this. This is a map of Africa. And if you think about it, you can put the United States, India, us, Argentina, Europe, and China, all within the confines of the country of, Af of the continent of Africa. That's how big Africa is. Wow. And how small all the rest of these are. This is where our natural resources, there are still natural resources for us to use there. So we're working hard to see to it that they don't get the use of those entirely that we get our share. However, we're in 
competition with the Chinese on that because they are trying to colonize countries in Africa. Mm-hmm. They have already colonized Kenya, and they have changed Kenya into little China. That's what's going on. And they're also doing that in the northeastern part of the United States. And they're doing that in Iowa. In Iowa, there are literally millions of hogs being raised for, chi- raised for Chinese pork consumption. It used to be that you could drive through Iowa and it was like heaven because all you smelled was the corn and the oats and the, the greenery. It was just lovely. Now you don't leave your windows open when you drive across the northern part of Iowa because all you smell are hog feces. Oh. It's that bad. Jeez. Yeah, yeah. Our neighbor within a mile and a half of us is raising, raising probably on his three or four places, 10, probably... I would say 50,000 small pigs for Chinese pork consumption. Oh my God. And this is happening in five states in the United States. And not even being pocket. I was just going to say, no one talks about it at all. Um, Well, we don't, we don't talk about that. We talk about Trump virus coming from China, which probably didn't, but we don't talk about the fact that this, this state is having its water, its land and its air made less pleasant by the fact that we are raising pork for Chinese, for the Chinese market. That's crazy. I had no idea. Well, of course, nobody has any idea. And, and farmers in this area don't want me to talk about it either because they're making money off it. Oh, I'm sure. And when you do talk about it, and I, and I, went, to a, I went to a supervisor meeting one day, and they were quite angry, the par- farmers were, because, uh, well, don't you want us to make money? And I said, yeah, go ahead and make money. But don't ruin my land, air, and water just so you can make money. And if you're going to, and if you're going to ruin the road in front of my house, driving on your, st- your steel-wheeled vehicles up and down that road that's brand new, you better know it's going to cost you some money, and I'll keep on complaining until you fix it. So they just kind of they just kind of keep me out of the supervisors. You know, I just you know, they don't just, let Jane in anymore, they, huh? <laughs> oh no, no, I'm not beloved in this community either. Because I think there's a. I thought my dad would say, you know, the difference between right and wrong. Do the right thing, damn it. And it's wrong to drive your steel wheel vehicles on this concrete road, particularly when what your business is is to <laughs> repair and sell John Deere tractors, all of which are on rubber tires, and which you drive up and down the road, testing them, but you aren't allowed by your by your religion to yeah. ride on a in a st- on a rubber tired vehicle. It's been this is the last thirty years of my life have been very interesting. The last your fifty years. Of life. I was just gonna say you're one hundred percent definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm too old for this nonsense. No, no, no. We wanted to thank you again for um for hopping on with us. And I've learned a lot in this in this almost yeah, we almost said an hour. I've learned a lot in this hour, and I think that our viewers there, are going to learn a lot. As there's well. something. There's something else I have to tell you. Okay. Tell Please, Stop telling people that you believe in the golden rule. Stop do unto me. others as you would have others do unto you. Treat others the way you want to be treated. Sure. Do you, young men, think that you want to be treated the way I want to be treated? Do I have the right to treat you the way I want to be treated? If we got on an airplane together and I had a piece of luggage that had to go in the overhead rack and you said to me, can I put that up for you, ma'am? I'd say, thank you very much. You must add a good parent. On the other hand, if you had a piece of luggage to go in the overhead rack and I said, can I put that up for you, Sonny? What would you say? I'd say, I'd say no, no, I don't know. It's all good. Yeah, I don't know. What would you say? I would, I would say no. Would you say, thank you. I would say you're very, you're very kind, but um, <laughs> no, no. Yeah, be, well, I would probably, I would probably be like, well, why would you? Does it look like I'm struggling with it, or does like why See, would? You? Yeah, you would, you, yeah, you would take that personally. You would I, think, what, what's you're matter, right. which don't you know I can put my own luggage up? What is your problem? <laughs> you see, you and I don't want to be treated the same. I don't have the Good right point. to treat you the way I want to be treated. The golden rule was originally in Chinese philosophy. It said, do unto others as others would have you do unto them. Mm. Treat others they want to be treated. But one of the main differences, according to psychologists, between white people, so-called white people, and people of other color groups is when white people come into a new environment, they immediately adjust the environment to fit their needs. Instead of the other way around. Okay. When people of color come into a new environment, they immediately adjust their needs to fit the environment. Every day. Mm, That's every what day. we have done with the golden rule. It should say, as it did originally, 
do unto others as others would have you do unto them. And in order for you to know how others want to be treated, you don't walk up to the first black person and say, how do black people want to be treated? No. And you don't do that to an Asian. You don't do that to a Mennonite. You don't do that to a Jewish person. You get a book about that group and read and learn about them and then realize that they need many of the same things that you do, but not exactly the same. And they don't want to be treated the way you are. That's a very egotistical statement to make. I can treat you the way I want to be treated, whether you like it or not. No, I don't have the right to treat other people the way I want to be treated. I have to treat them the way they want to be treated. That's the platinum rule instead of the golden rule. Do unto oh others God. as they would that's have what you they, do that's unto exactly, them. That's what I've been trying to tell people too. Of mm-hmm. so, many, so many people are coming out and saying, you know, well, why do you feel that way? Why, why do you feel that that was racist? Why do you feel like that? Well, to me, it's like, well, why don't it should be validated first? You know, what, you know what I mean? Like, if someone feels something a certain way, who are you to be like, no, you, you shouldn't feel, feel that way. way. And you, you, have a, you have the responsibility to say to them, why don't you feel that way? Instead of asking me why I feel that way, I want to know why you don't feel that way. What is it that makes you think that it's all right to behave in ways that you wouldn't want to be treated, but it's all right for you to do that to somebody else? Mm-hmm. And there's a, there's a clip on television, on, I don't know, someplace, of me saying to a huge group of college students, well, every white person in this room who would like to spend the rest of their life being treated the way we treat our black citizens, please stand. Nobody stands. And I say, uh, uh, have you seen that? Yeah. And they just sit there and I say, you didn't understand the instructions. I'll repeat it. Well, if you don't want to be, if you're white, you want to be treated the way we treat black people, please stand. Nobody stands. So what that means is they know it's ugly. They recognize it. They know it's happening and they don't want it to happen to them. Mm -hmm. So they don't believe in the golden rule either. They preach it. They teach it but they don't do it. Yeah. Which is being a good in, thing. Yeah. Actually doing in that yeah. act, being in the moment is different yeah. than preaching and just talking. Well, if you don't want to be treated the way you're treating other people, stop the way you're treating other people. And I said to a group in at Houston, University of Houston, 1,500 students and teachers in the room, and Angela Davis was on the stage with me. And uh, Angela Davis did her thing, and the woman is brilliant and talk some words that long. It was just really interesting. And then they said, Mrs. Elliott, is something you want to say? I said, yes. Well, every person in this room who considers himself or herself a member of the human race, please stand. They all stood. And they looked at each other like, is she crazy? I said, no, that means they're all members of the same race. That means you all came from the same ancestor, which means you're all 30th to 50th cousins of one another. So turn to the person on your right, stick out your hand and say, hello, cousin. And they did it. And then they started to visit. And then they started to laugh. And it was just like, oh, that's this beautiful. Fun. And then I told them about the fact that within 30 years, white people will be a numerical minority in the United yes. States of America. And so, can you, like, can yeah. you explain yeah. that for me, please? Yeah. And 30 years, within 30 years, white people will be a numerical minority in the United States of America because white people are not reproducing themselves as rapidly as people of color are in this country. And you need to realize that. Oh. And this woman, white woman down the bottom, third row back said, well, if those people, and I knew who she was talking about, I thought, oh, just shut up now, shut up now. But they never shut up now, you see. I'm, and I have a sweatshirt. <laughs> somebody sent, somebody sweat, sent me a sweatshirt on which it says, there's always time to shut up. Well, this woman, person wasn't reading this sweatshirt. And she said, if those people get power, aren't they going to want to treat us the way we've treated them? Aren't they going to want to get even? I said, that's your major fear, isn't it? That if people of color get power, they're going to get even with you. She said, yes, I think they are. I said, well, let's find out. I said, well, every person in this room who is, 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 considers himself or herself black and wants to get even with all white folks, please stand. Three young black males stood. The rest of them just turned and looked at him like, are you crazy? I said, there, see, they don't want to get even with all of us. Now, do you feel better about that? Well, she said, yes, I do. I said, <laughs> good, but now let's be honest about this. Uh, let's be honest about this. Well, every black person in this room who wants to get even with one or two white people, please stand. They all leap to their feet, every single one of them, <laughs> cheering and laughing and high-fiving one another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> see? <laughs> and she, now she's nervous against it. Now, see, they don't want to get even with all of us, but every one of them wants to get even with one or two of us. <laughs> now, if you want to be treated fairly in the future, behave in such a way that you aren't one of the one or two they want to get even with. Does that make sense to you? And she said, why, well, yes. And I said to the blacks, does that make sense to you? Once again, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, I thought, oh. and by now, Angela Davis has turned in her chair and she's looking at me like, 
I fell out of her chair. What's going on here? <laughs> oh, yes, and she, she's grinning. And after we got done, I went out in the, you know, where they were doing selfies. And she said, Jane, you and I could go on the road together. I said, tell me when you want to go. I'll be there. I had no rubber. But it was, it was just, she, I guess she had never sat in a group in which an old white woman said, this is all barn dirt. And it has to be ended. Yeah. It has to be ended. It will destroy this nation if we do not stop the idiocy, the ignorance of racism. Absolutely. There's only one race. And people keep saying, we're in this together. And in my case, that when they say together, I know they mean they're separating it into to get her. <laughs> and I understand that too. <laughs> but they can't get me because I'm, you know, I'll die before they get around to it. Every time I go on a college campus now, there are those three little boys down there with those red caps on and which it's on which it says make America hate again. It says great again, but it means hate again. Make no mistake about that. And yeah. then the last one I remember they were talking and went pointing at me and talking. I said, I stopped and I said, I said, all right, fellas, I know what you're talking about. You'd like to see me dead because of what I do to de to decrease the level of racism in this country. Now you can kill me. That's not difficult. You probably know how to do it. However, you need to know that if you kill me because of my attempts to decrease the level of racism in this country, you might make a martyr out of me and you might have to spend the rest of your lives celebrating Jane Elliott Day once a year. Now, do you want to do that? And then they'll just, no, no, no. I said, fine. And they make the cross. Go, no, no, no. I say, fine. Then keep your mouth shut and listen while I'm talking. <laughs> and when, the, when I'm done, those guys run out of the building and after them is a whole mess of young black men. And I have mm -hmm. a feeling that those guys are going to wish they had kept their hands in their pockets and mouth shut, shut while I was speaking. I feel the same way. There's a time and a place. There's a time and a place to shut up, and that was the time and the place for them to shut up. If Any they don't come to learn, they ought not to come at all. Place to shut up. Well, you, you know, we killed Martin Luther King Jr. We made a martyr out of him. Mm -hmm. His his words are stronger now than they would be if he were living, because we're on our way to destroying him, as as reputation wise, as fast as we could. But if he and Malcolm X had ever gotten together and their followers had gotten together, they would have changed the economic situation in this country because they had the numbers to do it. So they both had to die. And we all know that that's why they are dead. We all know that's why they were killed. It was hope. They, they were hope. That the they represented who, hope and they had to die. Yes, and hope, hope for me is an acronym for holding on to positive energy. I love that. And that's exactly what, that's exactly what Malcolm X, what Martin Luther King did. He held on to positive energy at the moment that they were shooting him, that that fool was shooting him, Martin Luther King Jr. was still preaching hope. And that's powerful. And that's what's going to live on forever, no matter what happened that night. Yeah, yeah. They can't, you can't kill hope. You can't nope. kill hope. Yeah. And you can't kill his words. Because there is energy in those words. And energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Exactly. And you cannot destroy the energy of his words. You can destroy his body, but you couldn't destroy his mind. And it's still in that other dimension. And we're still being taught by that man's energy, but what he did while he was on earth. If that isn't true, then you have to explain Jesus to me. And I don't think you can, but you can explain Donosaurus T. Rump to me. It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> I, love your, I love the nickname for him, by the way. I've heard you say that before. Well, yeah, he's, he thinks like a dinosaur, like T-Rex. T. Rump makes sense. He has a makes face. Sense. That looks like a rump, and we won't go any farther. But there's some other some other interesting. There. And we'll and we'll leave it off on that note. We'll, we'll leave it right for there. Imagination. We'll just leave it right there uh -huh. for your imagination. Uh. Okay, getting right along. Uh, I didn't say you, it if you think it, that's your fault. Oh, that exactly right. Well, Jane, this has been truly an honor. I mean, it really, really has. Um, you Absolutely. you've enlightened us very much. I know for me, this was personally just a, a, a milestone for me. I mean, I've only been teaching a couple of years now, but I learned about your exercise in 1968. Here's something, here's something you have to teach. Here's something you have to teach. Okay. Instead of teaching the three hours of reading, writing, and arithmetic, and only mm -hmm. one of those words begins with R, which is reading, <laughs> writing begins with a W and arithmetic begins with an A. a. So we're going to stop <laughs> talking about the three hours of education. Instead of teaching those three hours, teach the three hours of rights, respect, and responsibility I like and that, you right? will expect every student to respect the rights of every other student and if they don't they will be held responsible for their failure to do that 
I love that. Right. If we teach the three R's of rights, respect, and responsibility, you will do away with bullying in your classroom and on your school ground. I swear to you that if you do that and you hold people responsible for not respecting another person's rights, and that should be taught to teachers, the teachers in the building should be forced to observe the rights and to respect the rights of every child in the classroom, but they don't. And you know as well as I do that when a black boy, male comes into a classroom, a teacher, particularly a white teacher, will automatically devalue that child. You know it, and I know it. And it, this is, and they do it, and not out of unconscious bias. They do it because they have been taught to think less of people of color than they do of melanemic people. You know it, I know it, and they know it. And if you think that's unconscious bias, you've got another thing coming. They know exactly what they're doing, and they do it deliberately. It might as well say to do that in the standard course of study. In California, they look at the test. It's either at the third or the sixth grade level, the uh, standard achievement test at the end of the year, and project how many prison cells they'll need in the future on the basis of the number of people who fail those tests. Mm -hmm. Now, think about that. And if you treat black boys, dark-skinned children, or Hispanic children differently from the way you teach white, so-called white children, you are setting them up to fail and you know it. And if you haven't read this book, Rage of a Privileged Class by Ellis Coase, you get this book and read it. And read it before you go back to school. And if you don't want to read the whole thing, just read chapter three, which is entitled The Dozen Demons, 12 Things That a Black Male Has to Go Through every day in the United States of America. Just listen to a few of them. Inability to fit in. If you're a black male in this country, your fitting in is absolutely desperately hard. Exclusion from the club. If you're a good athlete, we'll accept you in our school, but if you aren't, go sit in the corner or out in the hall. Low expectations. We expect less of boys than we do of girls, and we expect a lot less of boys of color than we do of white boys. Shattered hopes. Your parents send you to their school, hoping that you're going to be, come out of school educated and ready to get into the workforce. Forget that. Faint praise. Well, you talk real good for a black person. Have you heard that one? That's the biggest one. That's the biggest one. That's a big, yeah, yeah you hear it all the time. You hear That's it all the, the time. One. And you're supposed to say, you're supposed to say, well, in fact, what you should have said is, I speak very well, instead of I talk real good. You've used the wrong adjectives there. And then they're, then they're really mad at you. <laughs> Presumption of failure. We're just quite certain. We're just quite certain that you're not going to make it. Coping fatigue. I don't know how black men and women stand constantly having to cope with the ignorance of racism. You've got to be tired out by the end of the day. You've got to be ready. You see, at the end of the day, after I'd come home from school, I, after we moved to get our kids out of that school, I drove back and forth every day. And every day on the way home, I would imagine that one of those teachers was in front of my car and I would accelerate and hit her with my car. Oh. I did it every, every night on the way home. <laughs> I had it because I was so angry. I'm so angry at that. But psychologists tell us that mental murder may keep you from doing the real thing. So then I got moved up to the junior high and I came down to a teacher's meeting and there she was. And I thought, what are you doing here? I thought I killed you. And then, oh my God, Jane, you've turned yourself into a monster. I was you really wanted her dead. Oh, 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 when I was, oh, so you have to be careful. Identity troubles. You have to pretend not to be what you are. Self-censorship and silence. Never say what you're really feeling because if you do, and it's against what the teacher is saying, it means that you don't think right. Because you know you don't because you have that mis miscolored skin. Mendacity, you have to learn to lie. If you're gonna be a black man in the United States of America, you have to learn to lie. And when somebody walks up to you and says, when I see you, I don't see you black, you have to say, thank you for not seeing my unfortunate skin color. Instead of saying, well, which, what else have you got wrong with you yeah, besides well, bad yeah. eyesight? Well, <laughs> yeah, how we don't do the, but you don't dare say what I say. Guilt by association. Every time a mm -hmm. black person commits a crime in this country and it gets in the paper on television, somebody says, somebody, that's the one time they'll speak to me. Somebody will say to me, well, I see one of your people were in the paper last night. And I say, was there something about my sisters or my brother or my father? No, you know who I mean. No, who do you mean, my people? Well, those, and then they use the N-word, and then we have to have a little lesson on 
why you don't use the N-word. I don't care if you call them my people. They are my people. I am their people because we're all members of the same family. We're members of the family of man, and we're all descendants from the same ancestors 300,000, 500,000 years ago. So call them my people if you want to. Absolutely. Oh, but yeah. don't make it sound as if there's something wrong with my people because huh, the major share of the crimes that are committed in this country are committed by melanemic people, not by melanaceous people. Mm -hmm. But the crimes that are committed by melanemic people get in the, get in the news. The crimes that are committed by people down, like Donald Trump don't get in the news as often. And they commit the most of them. And if you don't believe that, get Andrew Hacker's book, Black and Two Nations, Black and White, Separate, Unequal, and Hostile. Get it and read it. Then, I've you, heard get, of this then you get all the facts and figures. It's a good book. Everybody should read it because it tells the truth, which is something we are not used to seeing in books in this country. That's so true. anyway, now we're, we're, going, we're going to say good night again now, aren't we? We're about to <laughs> I will shut up. I, I know there's a time to shut up. Okay. No, right. Jane, we Thank appreciate it. We appreciate all the words and all the, and all the help that you did today. This was our greatest. This was, I don't have words. This was amazing. It was yeah, great. it was. It was. Uh, again, thank you. I hope you and your family all stay safe and, and, and have a great whenever we hear from you again. Well, you're most welcome for it. That I did. I'm, I'm glad you invited me. I really am. And if you learned anything, fine. If you didn't learn anything, that's your fault. Probably because you don't have enough hair and he has a cap on. <laughs> <laughs> Probably. Uh, have a great night, Jane. <laughs> Thank you, Jane. All right, you too. Bye now. Thank I'll you. turn that thing off so that I don't have to listen to you talking about me after I go. All right? <laughs> All right, Jane. <laughs>